Um, before we take questions, I'd quite like to hear you to hear the other side of the story. Uh, and I, I'm delighted that um, uh, Patrick Lintot has agreed to come in and speak today. So Patrick, like uh, Ed Sedesso, also uh, trained in, in Oxford, uh, as well as uh, at St Mary's Hospital, which is really the, the uh, uh, Swiss finishing school of uh, vascular surgery, um, where he did his research. Uh, but he works both in Oxford, but also, like Ed, who provides a service in Berkshire, uh, Patrick provides a service for uh, all, all of Buckinghamshire as well as working in Oxford. I'm delighted that he's here to tell you about the open uh, side of surgery so that you can get a balanced view. <laughs> Um, I think I'm the light relief here. Um, I think we've had this sat here for over three quarters of an hour, and no doubt you'll have a few questions um, coming up. I'll tell some of what I'm going to say will be a little bit repetitive, but hopefully not too much. There are also some graphic pictures, um, so if you want me to warn you about these beforehand. I will, but there are some pictures of actual surgery and blood <coughs> and aneurysms and stuff. If that's what you, if that's what you came for, <laughs> then there aren't too many, so don't get too worried. <laughs> this is an aneurysm. This is the pictures that you're used to seeing. Um, but actually, I've always thought they look a little bit like this thing on the on the left hand side which is from a 1950s film that, believe it or not, Steve McQueen actually starred in, called The Blob. <laughs> Beware of the blob. And effectively, that's what aneurysms have always struck me as. And uh, a great lady called Avril Mansfield, who I first learned under in the 90s, uh, when you open these aneurysms, you can get this huge kind of globule of, of red and yellow and gruesome stuff. And it's always struck me a little bit that we should probably think of it a bit like the blob. So a bit of early history. We've heard about Parodi in 1989, but actually the first one I think was done by Dupost. It could have been 47, it could have been 49. It depends a little bit on which paper you read. And he, he was a French chap. The first one in the UK was done sometime between 51 and 53, depending on what, well, Felix changed his mind quite a bit. I've spoken to him a number of times. Um, he, he was actually a surgeon in uh, London who retired to Buckinghamshire and actually died, unfortunately, only two or three years ago in his 90s. Um, not of an aneurysm. Um, and the first aneurysm that he repaired, he ever did, he didn't know quite what to repair it with because um, he couldn't speak French. And uh, he, uh, he actually used, got his wife to cut off the tail of one of his best dinner suits and sew him, sew him a linen, 400 thread count, I'm sure, maybe higher. <laughs> show him so, th sew a linen tube to use as a, as a suitable conduit, as a graft. It didn't last very long, but um, he, that was the first. And if you think of the early pioneers of Parodi, you can look back and 30, 40 years ago, people were doing similar things. But a little, just as exciting. Um, in 1996, I used that date just because it was the date I became a registrar, not for any other particular reason. <coughs> Um, you're looking across the hospitals, the, the big centres would say that you had about a 5% chance overall of making it out of hospital. And that's all comers. I would say that we were m tending to operate more on the younger age group then. I think we tend to be, be pushing things a little bit more. But certainly between 65 and 80, that was your sort of overall mortality. <coughs> You'd be staying in hospital for almost a couple of weeks, certainly seven days. Um, but the big thing was getting over the operation. It's a big deal, three to six months. How do you do it? Well, you need a few things. You need a theatre, hopefully something a little bit more modern than that. <laughs> you need a bit of kit. You do need some blood, and whatever you've heard from my esteemed and anaesthetic colleague, we don't always get away just with cell salvage. We frequently need to top it up, depending on um, how difficult the aneurysm is. And then you need a team that know what they're doing. Um, <coughs> And usually you get that. You're doing this trust in a way. In practice, what do you do? You make a big hole. You dissect out the big red tube. You put some clamps on the big red tube. And then you open it. Slowly. 
actually you don't open it slowly you open it quite quickly because the first thing that happens is all the little side branches back bleed at you these are the little blood, blood vessels that uh, there's one to the bowel and there's three or four that come up that go to the spinal cord and they will back bleed at you quite aggressively and sometimes the inside's calcified and you can't over sew them and you spend the first two or three minutes with the sucker kicking and the anaesthetist squealing and you sewing rapidly and occasionally it goes quiet for a while uh, you then stitch the top end in and if there's one thing that you're taught as a vascular trainee, it's that the most anxious part of your entire week will be letting that clamp off for the first time and hoping <coughs> that it holds. And usually it does, um, so you let that off slowly, then the bottom end tends to be a bit more straightforward, and then you just close up and that's it. So now it comes the gruesome pictures. Everyone happy? There's about four of them. I'll tell you when it's all over. Okay, so that's an aneurysm, so that's a big hole, and that's, that, that's the sort of pregnant uterus that actually is pulsing, so we know it's not a uterus, that's an aneurysm. Uh, I've, that's it in this sort of Hollywood picture when you push away all the other the nice stuff and you shine a light on it and you take a flash picture. That's quite a big one. Uh, that's slightly inflammatory. Uh, I think that was about 10 or 11 centimetres. And there's a sling at the bottom you can see around an artery. Um, that's actually, it's actually upside down. That one was taken by the anaesthetist. So the top of the artery is, uh, the neck of the artery actually is at the bottom of the photo. I should flip that around sometimes. You then open it, and that's what they look like on the inside. We've scooped out all the gunge that was hanging around there. <laughs> we like, like make it a little bit cleaner. And um, yeah, that's what it looks like. And it's stopped back bleeding and all, the, all appears to be well. I think you could just see how rubbish the edge of the artery looks. And we haven't got a pointer here, but it's just sort of scrofulous and sort of a bit kind of... Anyway, not perfect, but the aneurysm tissue is definitely thinner than decent aortic tissue, and if you try suturing onto aneurysmal tissue, it's a, it's a bit like suturing to moonbeams, as Prof Mansfield used to say. It just doesn't seem to work, so you need a decent decent something to take a bite and sometimes in emergencies you'll even take a bit of spinal um, fascia at the back to try and uh, make the thing hold. Uh, anyway, you suture in a piece of graft. This brown piece of graft has been soaked in, um, I can't remember, iodine or betadine or something to make it slightly less likely to get infected. Fortunately, infection risks with these grafts are extremely low, about 0.5%. Um, obviously, if it does get infected, that's a bit of a disaster. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that very briefly uh, later on. And you suture it in with a, something that looks a bit like fishing line, effectively. Proline, nylon, fishing line. So if any of you have ever fished, that's what we use. Um, occasionally, if you ships, uh, stitches, um, let it go. Make sure the anaesthetist is ready, because otherwise you, the blood pressure can drop quite dramatically. But to be honest, they're usually well prepared for this and well in control. And that's what it looks like as we're about to close up. And then we sort of tack the aneurysm sac over the top of it and close it and close it so it's protected from the bowel, which can confuse radiologists because five years later on they can say, oh, you've still got an aneurysm. No, you don't. You've had it fixed. Yes, the aneurysm sac's still there, but the aneurysm is fixed inside it. So you can occasionally get these sort of, especially with large aneurysms you can, that you've treated, you can get these slightly anxious phone calls from patients saying, this, I've had a scan, they say it's come back. Well, no, it hasn't. It's just that um, you can still see the remnants of the repair on the x-ray. So that's the open repair. That's all the squeamish pictures for those of you who want to open your eyes again. Okay, that's what it feels like to have one done. So I've been told. <coughs> this was from an extremely fit guy in his early 60s who was in the army and in the late 1960s in Germany he was involved in a train crash. And then he had his aneurysm repaired by me in about 2007. He said, I know what this feels like. It just felt a bit like that train crash that I was in 35 years ago. Um, this takes the wind out of your sails. You will feel for the first... You, it, you won't be in too much pain, believe it or not, because the, <laughs> the anaesthetists are pretty good at sorting that out, the epidural and so forth. The, suit, the, the edges, when you cut a wound, obviously when you stitch it back together again, there'll be a little bit of movement... But after about five days, it stops moving, and then it's not so sore. And after a couple of weeks, it's pretty well healed. You could take all the stitches out except for the ones that actually sutured the graft in, and you'd probably still hold together. That's how fast the body mends on a good basis, on a usual basis. So it's really quite quick. However, the wave of um, 
recovery is more than just the uh, just getting the wound to heal or the wound to look okay. Um, it's all about trying to get your body over this marathon that it's just run um, without necessarily training for it quite as well as it, it might have wanted to. So you tend to feel tired for, and fall asleep in the afternoons more than you might do already for about, uh, and that tends to go on for a good sort of four to six weeks depending a little bit on your level of activity. You lose weight, you lose weight often quite dramatically for the first um, six to 12 weeks, which might actually be a blessing for some of you, or it might not be for others. Um, your appetite goes off and you just don't feel like eating. That's why you lose weight and you're catabolic, you're burning calories. So this is the perfect state to, to lose weight. You burn off lots of calories and you feel tired and you, you just don't have as much energy. And you come back and see me at six weeks and say, well, thank you very much, I'm glad I'm through it, I'm beginning to feel a bit better, but why am I falling asleep and why am I tired? And I sort of smile at you and, and, and say, there, there, it'll be fine, just, just keep going, you're nearly there. And then, you can't, and then after three months, suddenly, two to three months, things begin to turn. You're feeling better. Any bowel issues with you of going a little bit too quickly or, or, going not, not, or perhaps being a bit constipated have long since disappeared. Your tummy's feeling fine. In fact, you've forgotten that, you've, apart from the big red line, you've, you've forgotten about that. And you're just beginning to get more energy. You're walking around. When you come back and see it at six months, I frequently get bottles because that's, that's, when you're, that's when you think, wow, yeah, done, through. And you're back to normal. You've unfortunately started putting weight on and usually put on all the weight that you've lost. <laughs> um, unless you've been very careful. Um, you can be careful if you're between three and six months and use this as a weight loss program. But by and large, your body will then go into an anabolic state after three months and you'll just have to look at a custard cream and put on, cat and put on weight. So <laughs> it goes the other way. And six months down the line, by and large, you can go off on holiday and think, yeah, been there, seen it, done it, got the T-shirt, all finished. However, you've had a bit of a rough time. So this is something um, uh, we did just locally in Buckinghamshire back in 2008 when we wanted to try and persuade the, the trust to let us do stenting, which was becoming tricky because there was lots of expensive kit to buy. So we just worked out how much we were losing on open aneurysms. And actually, we were losing quite a lot. Um, and this was mostly over us keeping, uh, mostly over blood products. We didn't have self-salvage in those days. Um, it was also over occasionally prolonged ITU stays and a couple of patients who stayed for an awful long time. And we worked out that we were losing money, and that's what the managers wanted to hear to help me get the C-arm. So I, we used that. So it, open aneurysms are probably a bit more expensive. And then EVAR came along. And then we had the EVAR trials. And you've heard about this, and I'll just concentrate on the EVAR 1 trial, which is what was... Ed was speaking about on the left, and those are the, the figures. And the biggest difference you'll see is that there's a lower mortality with stenting, and the quality of life, especially in the first three months, is much, much, much better. And um, we'll skip over the EVAR2, although I'm happy to talk about that at other time. But basically, it says that if people say you're not fit for an open repair at all, so you couldn't go into the trial for open because you wouldn't have survived the open repair, you, you can have EVAR, but actually it's a lot more risky. Look at that, 9%. Those are people who are very high risk, but they said, yes, I'll have a stent, and still 10% of them didn't make it out of a hospital after 30 days. So don't think stents necessarily always a fork in the park if, you're, if there are problems having aneurysms fixed. So you can ask, why did you do open? And we, we alluded to Jack Collin a little while ago, and um, this is his famous quote from an editorial in the BMJ where he was writing on the then thing, writing on his opinion of stents. And you could argue that those of us who do open, and in fact, all of us do open, even Ed Sedesu does, does open, <laughs> even Ed Sedesu, who is, who is our big stent uh, uh, pusher, and, and, and the, the modern vascular, young vascular surgeon, a lot younger than I am, um, you know, he, he will say that, um, why do we do open at all? If we could stent everyone, why aren't we stenting everybody? What are you doing that thing, Dave? Well, the Air Force is sending a globe master and they're flying it to the Arctic. It's not dead, is it? No, it's not. Just frozen. I don't think it can be killed. But at least we've got it stopped. Yeah, as long as the Arctic stays cold. So that's what happened at the end of the blog. <laughs> they buried it in the Arctic. However, the thing about stents is there's global warming. 
the Arctic is melting. Stents are not, uh, are not a, a durable cure always. Yes, we buried it in the Arctic, but the Arctic isn't forever. And these things, these leaks that occur around the edges, those small blood vessels that when, I open them, when we open the sack, we over-sew them, the stent doesn't necessarily address those. So you put the stent in, you seal the top and the bottom, but those back branches can back lead into the sack. And on a number of occasions, they can still cause it to become under tension, and therefore it can still theoretically grow, and even, although admittedly rarely, go on to become big enough to rupture again. So if you look at the five-year follow-up data from the EVAR trial, you can see that actually the mortality for, from the aneurysms uh, on the open side has gone up a little bit, and that's from things like in longer-term infections after 30 days, things that people who hadn't got, died in the first 30 days but actually weren't doing too, bad, too well, or they had problems with infections, which happens about 0.5 to 1% of the time. But the EVA mortality had crept up, so people were having problems with the stents, and that they actually were, when trying to fix them, they ended up uh, unfortunately not surviving. And if you looked at the um, aneurysm-related mortality, morbidity, sorry, it was much higher because you were kept having to go back and do extra bits and pieces for the stents. And the amount of times that you had to go back in and do something was much, much higher on the stents. And actually, the cost of EVO was going up. Now, 8 to 15 years, EVO trials were done a long time ago with relatively crude stent devices. But if you look at that same group now, the all-cause mortality is actually higher in the stent group than it is in those who had done open. There are lots of reasons for that. Partly, I suspect, it's because the open group who made it were pretty tough characters. And if you're keeping going, then, then you are, you're, you're built to last. But also, it's because, by and large, you didn't need anything done. Once the open operation was done, fire and forget, all sorted, you're through your six months of, of difficulty, it's done. Uh, late complications, re-interventions in the EVO group were up to 41%. And late complications occurred even in stents which they thought had sealed and that four or five years thought were fine, but they then started having problems because the aneurysm kept growing around it. So there was an uh, ongoing need for surveillance. So there is a balance. There are lots of questions with aneurysms. Um, some of the questions earlier were, why don't I have it done now? I want it done five centimetres or three centimetres or four centimetres. Well, I think you can see from the data that having any operation always faces a risk. And if the risk of the, having the aneurysm op operated on, even with a stent, is more than the risk of it rupturing, then you would be a fool to vote for the operation. You should wait until the time that the risk of doing nothing is less, is more than the risk of doing something. And then the risk of open versus stenting, well, that's a balance. It's a big stone versus lots of little stones, and it's difficult always to make that choice. And that's why you need to have all the options laid out for you. You take the advice of your surgeon and your friends and your peers, and then you make an informed decision about what appears to be best. Thank you. <laughs>